Professor Fan Gang, welcome to In Conversation. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Now, growth for China this year is looking pretty okay. Good bounce back. But the IMF is already saying that next year it's going to slow. Is that a worry that we should have here in Asia? Because China is traditionally a tremendous driver for growth for all the rest of us. Well, uh, it is possible uh, to have some slowdown in 2022 uh, when this uh, export surge uh, petering out. That's, that's definitely it's a possibility. But how much, the, the first question, how much it will, it will you know, so-called petering out? Uh, the world economy is still not, uh, not really strongly recovering. Uh, I don't see, you know, 2022 will be very different from 2021 because the pandemic is still a uh, lot of uncertainties. You know, the variant, you know, all this kind of the variant now, the Delta, the maybe uh, next year with Omega, you know, <laughs> that, that kind of uh, uh, the, 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 the variant. So if the pandemic cannot be totally disappear, uh, this kind of the, you know, what the trade system was still working like, you know, 2020 and 2021. You know, the countries need, a, you know, a lot of the, you know, the, there's a lot of demand for our Asian countries. So that's the number one issue. The second issue is that if the, uh, you know, the ASEAN country have the control of the pandemic more than other countries, you know, then a uh, lot of the uh, demand for export will go to the ASEAN country as well. You know, now, it, you know, in the early stage, it may concentrate too much, very much on China, you know, come into China, but then next stage may be, uh, you know, distributed to the other country, particularly the ASEAN countries, which is uh, now, I think, the better than the other countries in terms of controlling the, the pandemic. So uh, that means that uh, we may need to worry China slow down, but uh, for the other country, maybe not the, not the bad news. So from other countries' point of view, it's not, the, not necessarily bad news because uh, the, de the demand can diversify to, 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 to the region. ASEAN ended up being China's largest trading partner last year, which is a first. That's right. Without significant Chinese growth, it is, can never be good news, not just for ASEAN, but for the world. So is 5.6% enough? Or will it mean also a certain level of joblessness in China? Well, the, uh, you know, the job, job issue is always there, no matter you have 8% growth or 6% growth or 5% growth. China have 1.4 billion population. You know, this job issue is a continue the, to be the issue. And particularly now the AI, the technology, you know, the, the robbers, you know, all, all the, you know, the things are related to the, this job issue. Uh, so it's, a, it's always there. And uh, what we need is not a one year surge, one year 
jump of the growth. We need to continue. We need a stability of the growth uh, without, without interruptions by any kind of crisis or uh, market turbulence. So that's what China is doing. We are not trying to stimulate the economy. Uh, you know, we, we can stimulate it to, to, to 8%, but it, what the next? After the 8%, you may have, you know, kind of the uh, market crisis. Uh, you may have, uh, you know, kind of uh, overcapacities, uh, financial problems you need to deal with. It. And that, that will, you know, damage for the long-term stability, long-term sustainability of the growth. So it's better to follow the trend and keep the balance, keep the equilibrium for the economy. Then we have a long-term growth that will be benefited for everybody. So you're saying actually, Professor, uh, that the PBOC and other institutions should not over pump the Chinese economy. That's, that 5.6% right. next year, in other words, moderate uh, growth next year is okay. You don't need to be charging ahead. Yeah. Well, there is a debate. There is a debate on this issue. Should the PBOC do more? Uh, you know, the fiscal policy can do more. But, but generally speaking, what China has been doing in this you know, couple of years is try to keep the equilibrium. We, we, we got the lessons from the uh, 2008, 2009, in the financial crisis, and we, we, we adopted very big stimulate policies. Then we have, uh, you know, you know, few years, five years of, of uh, dealing with this, uh, you know, overcapacity and the bad loans, you know, all those things. So this time, people still adopt some kind of stimulus policies, but try to be balanced. Try to be stay with the uh, uh, equilibrium. Don't go too far, as negative interest rate, as the uh, huge debt, like some other country do. We we try to avoid that. So by this way, I would say you have better you know future for the sustainability for longer time, not not a short term jump, but then you turn down. Uh, that kind of the turbulence is not really good for the economy if you want to have long-term growth. Why aren't Chinese shoppers shopping more? <laughs> uh, I think Chinese shopping more is quite a recovered, uh, particularly, you know, for what? For luxury goods. Before Chinese go out, go, go abroad to buy the luxury, work, the luxury goods, but now buy home, in the home shopping mall. So from that point of view, I would say the shopping mall sales volume actually increased during this pandemic uh, because of the high you know price you know luxury goods but we never say shop chinese shoppers buy enough <laughs> it's it's always a, you know the, the saving rate is still high you know uh, uh, people are still you know uh, not really go to the uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, cons consumptions like what a, what a, the, the other country, you know, the Western country people do. Uh, people are very reluctant to borrow money to co consume. They borrow money for investment, but not really buying borrow money for con consumption. So that's still the, 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 the issue. Younger generation be better, 
But I will ask, I will argue that there's one new uh, engine for the consumption growth. That is a newly retired generation. Newly retired generation is different from previous retired generation because newly retired are the people who have the money, who have an income which supports higher level of consumption. Before, people didn't, people save a lot, but people didn't earn much. So they didn't save much for their retirement. So when they retired, they, they, they spend very little. So they really, uh, you know, not, not, not in the consumption uh, market. But now the new generation comes, they, they got the money. They, ha they have high savings in the past. So now they did save. And when they did save, they have a lot of money to, to spend. So they travel, they have, a, 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 you know, quite a, a, you know, luxury dinner, you know, they, they have, a, you know, uh, you know, holidays and you know, all those things are very different from, from previous generations. Yes. For me, as long as consumption is going up rather than going down, that is good news for me. <laughs> Saving rate has been, re you know, decreased in recent years from something like 50% to 43, 42%. It, it's improving, uh, but still a lot of, lot of work to do uh, on, on that uh, perspective. China's Ministry of Commerce even had to hold a national consumption month just recently, trying to get people to go out and, and buy. Uh, That's right. Is there the risk though that China might actually hit um, the middle income trap? Well, people always say China's uh, consumption is not very high. But think about this, it has not been high for 20 years in terms of a percentage of the GDP. You know? So that's why I argue as long as it's not, not you know, decrease further, if it keep the similar ratio of the GDP, that is not a sluggish. That's maybe the normal, normality for the, for the moment. Sometimes, you know, it's, it's not a, uh, it's a kind of the natural process of the, uh, uh, you know, the economic growth. And also there are factors of the uh, culture, uh, the, the, the business environment, you know, uh, the family structures, the population growth, all those things. A lot of factors are, you know, making these differences. And uh, Japan is a good example because Japan shares some similar cultures with, with China, with Chinese people. Uh, so there could be uh, some similar factors which are well uh, uh, have the impact on Chinese consumers' behavior. Uh, but I would say at the moment, you still see very different things from Japan in past, say, 20 years, since 90s. Japan is a very homogeneous country. Uh, when they come into the uh, 1990 and the 2000s, because Japan's high growth in 60s and the, until the 80s was not at the similar stage as China did in you know past the 40 years. Japan passed Japan passed the process, the stage of industrialization, urbanization, in early of last century. And then it recovered, it, the 60s, since 60s, Japan recovered from the war. So that is a different story of, of Chinese people. So that's why you can see China, in China now, we have very rich uh, groups in the coastline, people, maybe account for 10% of the, you know, so-called middle class, you know, uh, 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 people. But 70% of people are still in a low income country, people in the countryside or small cities, they're moving, they're looking for the better opportunities. They are, we are still in the process of industrialization, urbanization. So that's, that's a still far away from the finish. So from that point of view, I would say uh, Chinese people, Chinese market will not follow the example of Japanese market did in the 90s.
Are US-China relations on a better footing, or are they pretty much unchanged, even though a new man is in the White House? Uh, I'm not very optimistic about, about this. Uh, of course, if you're talking about the trade relationship, it's uh, per se, Chinese-US trade increased you know, in the past few years. You know, particularly trade deficit from US point of view increased rather than decreased. So, I mean, the, the current uh, means of trade war didn't work. Didn't work reduce this trade imbalance. Uh, but I don't see much, you know, uh, better off uh, in the foreseeable future. Why? In general, particularly from point of view of technology, uh, you know, the, the stretch, so-called strategic competition, uh, national security, all those issues. I don't see, you know, in the near future, any fundamental changes. Given the uh, current situation, American uh, politics, uh, given the, uh, the current uh, uh, international uh, relationships, uh, I really see, you know, the continuation of this kind of uh, tension. Don't the Americans have things that the Chinese want to buy? Well, a lot of things. Exactly. <laughs> well, the, the problem now is that U.S. just you know, cut off the sales of what China want to buy, the technology. You know, uh, of course, China will not, you know, not very interested in buying soybean or pork or nitro gases, which is, which is from the third world, right? This is not, should not be from the US, which have the comparative advantage of high technology, but they are just not sell, just not sell the technology. That's what China interested. And, uh, and uh, uh, we are learning from US, that's we are interested. But US would like to cut, cut off uh, so that's a that's a that's a problem. Uh, of course, even we have without the, you you said the, the political factors. Uh, China definitely have less and less things to buy from U.S. because we are growing. We are making things by ourselves. Not no longer to have the demand for the for the for the import. But if you know, if you cut off all the technologies from Chinese buyers, then you force Chinese to make things by themselves. That's a, that's that's a, that's the only way China can grow, and the Chinese companies, Chinese government, really working on that. That means in the future, what we buy from U.S. You know, if everything we can do by ourselves like computer chips, like everything, you know, high-tech things. So that's the trade even, even more difficult, you know, for, for, the, for the two countries. So that's why I would say it's better to have international cooperation, to have exchanges. Uh, you have something for me to buy. I have something you, you want to buy. So that makes the trade. That makes the international economy not block the way of the market. So that's a that's a why I'm not very you know optimistic for the future of the U.S. China in her, the relationships, particularly for the trade. I mean, you were trained at Harvard as well. What do you say to the American economists when you meet them? Uh, to the American economist, <clears throat> well, American economists, a lot of economists that really understand better. You know, understand uh, this uh, basic relationships, basic uh, economic equations. You know, uh, but they have some politicians influence. who don't understand. That's right. That's right. The economists have some influence, particularly the long-term influences. I believe they will play the very important role, very positive roles uh, in the 
in the, in the long term, you know, reshaping uh, China-U.S. relationships. But currently, you know, politicians, uh, journalists, <laughs> you are in the journalism, journalists, uh, all those kind of the social sentiment, sentiment are really uh, very anti-China. Uh, they cannot accept that China now is advanced. Uh, you know, have the capability of a competition against the U.S. They are, they are not, and particularly when they are looking for the jobs, they are looking for the, 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 the growth, they are looking for the leadership of the world. Uh, they take China as a, uh, as a rival. So I think economists are not uh, able to change that very much. We, we can give the fact give the calculation, uh, but, you know, politicians account for political cost, political revenue, not really economic and trade revenue. So that's a different story, different equations they use. Final question, Professor. If you were to look at the next five years, do you think that the world economy will be moving back to a normal situation? Or do you think that the pandemic has left such deep scars that it cannot be erased. Deep scar, definitely. Uh, it, it, it's a very good word you used. Uh, deep scar, not only for, you know, for the damage of the economy, uh, damage of the growth, damage of the consumption, but also will make people to think about the human uh, history, think about uh, the institutions, think about the, the government, think about the, the, you know, the behaviors of, uh, of, of, of the society, uh, you know, a lot of things. This is a really uh, historical uh, changes uh, for, for the human, human being. Uh, but how long, I'm really not quite sure, five years Hopefully. Professor Fan Gang, thank you so much for being on In Conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Good. Good to see you. And I'll see you soon.